In this module, we're going to give you an overview of the Azure platform as a whole. These are some of the fundamental things you just need to be aware of before you hit some of the subsequent modules. In particular, we're going to cover the following. The cloud models that you need to be aware of that you may have heard about already in the industry. Azure's core infrastructure, including Azure regions and what you need to know about resource groups, which we'll use throughout the course. Networking, virtual machines, and then we'll talk about app and DB services, as well as some of the other services available to you in Azure. Finally, ending off with the Azure portal itself and how you can get around the portal and access Azure. Let's begin by taking a look at the cloud service models. And if we look at the traditional way, this is what we would deploy in our data center. And this is the stack that we basically have to manage. So from networking through storage, servers, then we often have a virtualization layer in the last 10 years an operating system we might deploy and then we have to run some middleware on top of it, runtime, data applications, etc. But all of this, you get the point, we would manage and maintain in the data center. Well, cloud came along you know, after virtualization, built upon that idea and gave us additional models. The first one being infrastructure as a service, also known as IaaS in the industry. The big difference being is that we no longer manage those bottom four pieces of the stack. So that takes away networking, storage, servers, and virtualization. In the Azure world, Azure will manage all of those for us. We don't have to go and physically plug any cables in. We don't have to you know, rack storage arrays and servers. And we don't even have to maintain our own virtualization layer like you often would previously with VMware or Hyper-V. You do, however, in this model, still need to manage the operating system up the stack itself. But then there were other options that came along. Notably, platform as a service. This is the common one that's gaining traction in the industry. You know, you hear the term PaaS when people talk about this one. And this takes away things like the operating system, middleware, and runtime from you. You still have to manage your applications and data that run on top of that. But now in many cases, and all platform as a service services differ slightly in what they offer, but perhaps you don't need the OS anymore and using web apps, which you'll hear about a little bit later on. Or perhaps you know, you've know you got a database service that's readily available to you. You don't need to manage the SQL engine or anything anymore. That's all managed for you by a database service. And finally, we have software as a service. This is fully managed. These are SaaS-based services, typically things like ServiceNow or other hosted services. Think of things like even Dropbox and things like that as well. These are completely hosted services for you. You know, in some cases, you're still going to manage your application that runs on top of those, but you're not really supporting any of the plumbing at all, really. You're just kind of working and configuring the application. Then we've got things like Azure regions. And this is very important. You know, think of that traditional model. When we wanted to build a data center, it's a lot of work, right? We would have to typically put it in one location. Often it's the building that your company you know, is housed in. And you know, when, when you want to expand, it's very, very difficult because you'd have to go and build another entire data center maybe somewhere else in the world. Well, Azure gives us over 50 regions worldwide. It's available in over 140 countries. And as you can see, there's a mixture there of available regions, announced regions, and some regions now have what they call availability zones. So this is a region, say, for example, in uh, central US there, we see there's availability zones present. Well, the region is there, but there's actually individual data centers inside that region that you can choose to place your workloads into so you can get additional availability. But you can just see the global coverage. So if you want to deploy your application and have it closer to your customers, you can do that. If you've got data sovereignty rules that you need to adhere by, that also allows you to keep data perhaps in the country of origin much more easily. There's another concept as well that goes with this, which is region pairs. So when Microsoft Azure built the regions, they paired them up. So that way, when they patch them and do their maintenance, you can know that only one region in the region pair will be you know, susceptible to maintenance at a particular time. So just a good thing to know as well. If you're choosing a second region, often a lot of customers have a primary region and they have a second region for failover. Well, knowing which one is paired is very, very important. One of the fundamental concepts you do need to know about are Azure resource groups because Azure resource groups are where you put all of your different objects. They're essentially a container uh, that you can put your web apps in, your virtual machines, databases, any service that you see us deploy in the course, we will often deploy in a resource group. Uh, the good thing is it's very easy to manage, but just be aware of this too. When you delete the resource group, every single thing in there is destroyed. 
It's helpful because it allows us to just take away all the components and associated components of applications that share the same life cycle very easily, but you just need to be careful with it. And there are things like resource locks and things that you'll see throughout the course so you know how you can use them wisely. Now let's take a look at some of the fundamental networking features you need to be aware of. Well, first of all, there's this fundamental concept of a VNet that you can see on screen right now. And within our VNet, we have subnets. This is the networks that we can ultimately connect our virtual machines to. So virtual machines will connect to a subnet, which has a subnet range, and that's what gives it its IP address. Much like, you know, your home machine on your home network, it's an IP address from a subnet that you've defined in your home router. Same thing here, you can define multiple, multiple subnets out in Azure inside of your, your same VNet. So you essentially connect it into the VNet and more specifically choosing a range from that subnet. One thing to note is that VNets are isolated. So there's complete isolation between them unless you choose to connect them using some of the other things we'll talk about a little bit later on. In addition, you do have internet access available to you. By default, all the machines you put in the subnet can talk out to the internet unless you put any additional rules and things on top of that. And you can talk in, but you need a public IP address to be able to do that as well. In addition, you can put pretty much any of the Azure resources that you want into a VNet. And so when you connect, you know, whether it's web apps or VMs or other services, there'll be specific options to connect them into the specific network that you want. So you can mix and match services in those virtual networks. And they can be a mixture of PaaS or IaaS services as well. In addition, you can connect VNets to other VNets. There's a concept known as VNet peering, as well as connectivity to on-premises using a variety of VPN gateway, express route, and other technologies that are available. Finally, you have something on there called a traffic filter. That's what the NSG is. There's certainly ways to do things like IDS, IPS, that's intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, for anyone not familiar with those terms. You can route traffic through to devices like Palo Alto and Checkpoint, or you can use this built-in traffic filter, which is an NSG, also known as a network security group, to restrict traffic. Uh, but as I said, you can also do routing as well. So there's default routing behavior, so by default, all those machines in subnet A, subnet B, they can all talk to each other. If we pair a VNet with another VNet, the VMs or services in that VNet can talk to the other one, but that's the default routing behavior. If we want to change it and redirect the routes, like I said, through like a Palo Alto or a Checkpoint or one of the other services out there, that's available to you as well. The other big thing to have a fundamental knowledge in are virtual machines, and we start off with our hardware platform on screen there, and think of your hardware just like the traditional way. You know, we would have a CPU, we would have memory, we would have disk, you know, and often when we're doing this on-premises, we would have an operating system, so Windows or Linux, and then we would install our application, and that's the old way we did things. That's still the way when we have a machine at home, we have a physical machine with our hardware, CPU, memory, disk, we put our Windows machine or our Mac OS on top of it, and then we load all our applications on top of that. Well, virtual machines changed the game when that came along, because what happened was, you still have CPU memory disk that goes into a set of hardware, but another layer was added in between called a hypervisor. So things on premises like VMware or Hyper-V were the common ones that were out there. And then on top of that, you would couple up your app and OS together into what is ultimately known as a virtual machine. And these are your VMs, and they allowed us to basically you know, oversubscribe those hosts because often what would happen was you weren't using all of that CPU and memory on those machines. You know, every time an enterprise would stand up a new application, they'd buy a whole host of new hardware, but a lot of it went to waste. So by putting lots and lots of OSs and apps on the same set of CPU, memory, and disk, you were able to get a lot better consolidation and value for money and a return on your investment there. Now, in addition to the virtual machines and networking, which are really some of the core infrastructure things you need to know about, there's a number of app and DB services. These are the PaaS services we talked about earlier. And in particular, under app services, we've got something called web apps. This is a PaaS service that allows us to take applications that traditionally we might deploy on IIS, Internet Information Server, like ASP.NET applications, and run them directly on the PaaS service known as web apps without us having to manage that OS and install the IIS server, etc. 
In addition, there's mobile apps for mobile device backends. That's another service that can also run in the same app service environment, as well as serverless functions such as functions and logic apps. So both these are a little bit different. Azure functions are really serverless pieces of code that you would write, and then they will execute on a compute node that Azure has available for you. So instead of you writing your code and then kind of deploying it all on a single virtual machine or operating system, this now you write the code and it just you know places it on a machine to run for you. In addition, you've got logic apps, very similar, but these are not really code heavy. These are more about connecting different services, you know, on the internet or between different Azure services. And you'll hear more about those, you know, like I said, throughout the course. The other big one though is containers, and more specifically, Azure Container Service, also known as AKS. Often, you know, people call it Azure Kubernetes Service because it's predominantly now. Kubernetes is the main standard that people are going for in the container world. And you'll hear more about this as well, but this allows us to couple up and deploy and essentially containerize applications. So this concept of build, ship, and run. So an app developer can build the application, you know, build it into a container, ship it off to a container repository, and then run it on a container host when the time comes. Uh, in addition, we've got those database services. So we've got things like SQL. Uh, in particular, we've got Azure SQL in there, as well as SQL managed instances. These are currently in preview, so they're not covered specifically in the course. Neither is Azure SQL, but it's good to know that those are out there as well if you're going to be using Azure, because you don't necessarily have to spin up a VM and then deploy SQL on top of it. You know, you've got this PaaS service available to you. In addition, there's Azure Database for PostgreSQL and Azure Database for MySQL or other hosted database services available as well. Finally, there's another one which is Cosmos DB, and this is a pretty interesting one because for global scale, and if you're trying to use things like MongoDB, you can run that on top of Cosmos, and it can kind of scale out geographically. So again, not specifically covered in the course, but just know that, it, that it's out there as well. From a storage perspective, there's some other services that we need to talk about there. So if we look at storage, we've got blob storage. This is covered in detail in the course itself. And you just really need to know that a lot of people are used to traditional file systems, you know, whether it's on-premises or Windows file shares, etc. And a blob store essentially is just a container of storage where we can store binary large objects. So these could be images, videos, things like that that we just want to keep out there. In addition, there's tables. There's files, that's your typical kind of file share, and there's messages as well that you can put up in Azure as part of their storage services. There's also a whole host of other services out there as well. So things like machine learning and AI, as well as things like cognitive services. So things like facial recognition, you know, translation for speech, you know, you can automatically do closed captioning and things like that. And we'll hopefully circle back and do a video on that sometime soon because that's something you know, we like to do for the course is to actually, okay, record the course, and then when we want to add the closed caption in, we can put it through something called Video Indexer, takes these videos, takes the audio, you know, and turns it into, you know, English closed captioning, and then I can choose to translate that. You know, results vary by language and how it translates, but pretty interesting services that are out there, as well as things like IoT as well. So IoT is around, okay, devices that I might run, you know, things like uh, you might have your fridge might be connected to the internet, you might have cars connected to the internet, you know, in the manufacturing community, this is very, very big right now, as well as things like, you know, farming and, and other things like that, where you can have devices out there that need to check in and send messages and IoT, again, also known as Internet of Things, is very powerful there. There's also services that are key, and these are covered predominantly in the course. Things like Identity, so that's Azure Active Directory. You've probably already seen that by now. Even if you're using Amazon Web Services, a lot of people use Azure AD as their single identity source. You know, it's a fully you know, managed identity platform for you and has a whole host of security features in there, which brings me on to operations and security as well. And a lot of these are covered in the course. So these are things like log analytics for searching across all of your different services that you've connected into log analytics, security center for detecting threats in your environment. You know, there's a whole host of services there as well as monitoring, alerting, all the usual things that come with that as well. The big thing though, from an access point of view, predominantly throughout the course, we will be in the Azure portal and we will also do a lot of demos in Azure PowerShell as well. But if we just go to the portal very quickly, it's this link, which is portal.azure.com. And if we select it, this will take us to the portal. 
uh, where you'll log in. Again, just make sure you have that trial account already set up and you'll get a dashboard, you know, typically when you log in and it'll have a bunch of things on there, like, you know, services you've deployed, there's help and support tabs, uh, there's virtual machines, this one I've built earlier, Skylines VM, but just get used to the portal for a little bit. So on the left-hand side, often you'll see we're going to this create a resource section on the top left. If we just want to see all services, we can click this and then this will bring up all the services available in Azure and we can filter them, we can search there, you can search right here in the filter. You can also search in this box at the top. This is actually where I go a lot of the time. I simply go straight up here and if I'm looking for virtual machines, I'll type in virtual machines. Click that and that will take me to the virtual machine section where I've got my virtual machine running there right now, just one currently for this demo. But also on the left hand side, you'll see these favorites. So you've got things like if you want to go back to your dashboard, you can click here. If you want to just see all of the resources run in in your Azure subscription, you can click this and you can see we've got a whole bunch of resources there. If I want to go to those resource groups I mentioned, I can click this and I can see all different resource groups that I've got in my environment. And then if I want to delete something, I can go into that resource group, delete it, and it will delete all of those objects inside there. So if I go to Skylines Intro as an example, I can click this one. This is where I deployed that virtual machine. This is the resource group, and you can see it contains a whole bunch of things that got deployed along with the virtual machine. And if I want to delete that resource group, I would simply click Delete Resource Group, and it would ask me to type in the resource group name. and then I click delete and now it will delete that resource group and everything inside of it. Now there is no going back from that so make sure you've got backups if this is something critical that you might need to get back later on but you know for the purposes of the demos and things you go through we typically create a new resource group you know for every single module and then we just delete that resource group when we're done and then that cleans everything up. Uh, in addition we've got things like the app services I mentioned so if you want to go in here and deploy those web app services, those are there. I showed you virtual machines from the top, but you can also get to it on the left-hand side. And same with things like virtual networks. They're already there along with storage accounts for you. And you can change this around. You can put your own things in there. But it just helps to get used to the portal itself and, and make sure you're familiar. In addition, you'll need to know about PowerShell. Now, there's a couple of ways you can do it, and you'll see a few examples throughout the course. In some cases, we will open up PowerShell on our machine, and you can do PowerShell on the Mac, you can do PowerShell on Windows. Just make sure you've installed the Azure command bits that you need as well. Uh, but the easiest way to do it now is actually using Cloud Shell, which is on the top of the screen. There's this icon right here. If we click it, it actually opens up a Cloud Shell for us. And if we select on the left hand side, we've got Bash there. We can change that to PowerShell. I'm going to click restart. So I'm going to restart my Cloud Shell with PowerShell and it's going to restart that. And this will actually open up a PowerShell client inside of the Azure portal for you already logged in. So it's a much, much easier, you know, to get in there and actually run your scripts just by using the built-in Cloud Shell. It's a new feature they added recently and you definitely are expected to know about it for the 7533 exam. And you can see it's come up there. Now I can select PowerShell Windows. It'll ask you to create a storage account. This is where it's going to keep uh, any file shares to persist files throughout. But if I go ahead and click Create Storage, and it will go ahead and now provision that Cloud Shell. Okay, and after a little while, probably three or four minutes, if this is the first time you're loading up PowerShell, that will connect in and you know get everything ready for you. And then you can simply go ahead and start running your PowerShell commands just like you would normally in your PowerShell client. Now that brings us to the end of this module and hopefully you got a good overview of Azure and this should definitely give you the fundamentals you need to get going, particularly for the certification and just you know Azure knowledge as a whole. In particular, you learned about the different cloud delivery models. So remember those IaaS models, PaaS models, SaaS models, and the differences there, as well as the core infrastructure for Azure. So those are the regions, the VNets, virtual machines, resource groups. Those are key things to know. In addition, you learned about those other service offerings that are available to you in the Azure environment. And finally, we explored the Azure portal as you get going with the course make sure that you check out the Azure portal, get familiar with it, make sure you can open up a PowerShell client, whether that's via the Cloud Shell, just via your own one on your laptop, that's fine. 
But with that, this is the end. And if you have any questions at all, just let us know. Send us a tweet at Skylines Academy. Leave a comment in the YouTube channel or on the module page if you have any questions on this module because we do want to make sure you have the fundamental knowledge to get going with Azure and we want to arm you with as much as possible.